She probably doesn't need an introduction for quite a few of you who've registered for this talk, but for the rest of you, she's a professor of labor studies at the School of Labor and Urban Studies and a professor of sociology at the Graduate Center, both at the City University of New York. Previously, she was at the University of Massachusetts Amherst Labor Center. Um, it should be mentioned that she received both her PhD in sociology and her MA in industrial relations from none other than the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, she's best known for her research on living wage campaigns and movements. She's the author of Fighting for a Living Wage and Labor, Labor Movements, Global Perspectives. And she's the co-author of The Living Wage, Building a Fair Economy, as well as The Measure of Fairness. She's also author or co-author of several dozen academic articles and book chapters, as well as dozens of contributions to media outlets such as Jacobin, Labor Notes, and Against the Current, among others. Her current research focuses on globalization and labor community coalitions. She's really more than just an academic. She's an activist scholar or scholar activist whose work has always been motivated by a concern for its real world relevance, particularly for working class people. And in that respect, like the people after whom the Havens Wright Center is named, she embodies the combination of scholarly rigor and progressive social and political commitment that the center seeks to promote. She's really sort of a quintessential Havens Wrights uh, visiting scholar, though her visit will have to be vir a virtual one today. Um, and as evident in the title of her talk, um, you can see her scholar activism at work. It's titled From Minimum Wage to General Strike, The Possibilities and Limitations of Worker Organizing in Anti-Capitalist Movements. So. No other further ado, to step. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, it's really, I can't say what an honor it is to be part of this uh, lecture. Um, the Haven Center was so fundamental to my own um, graduate school career. Um, it's really helped shape who I am today as a scholar because, you know, we just had one after another amazing role models come through the Haven Center and really make me see that it was possible to be a scholar and an activist. Um, at once. And I'm also so honored to be invited here um, by Patrick and, and the Haven Center, Haven's Wright Center staff, um, including um, one of my former uh, professors and committee men members, Gay Seidman. Um, and it's especially an honor to speak uh, at the Haven's Wright Center. It was not called that when I was there in school, but um, Eric Olin Wright was my advisor, and um, you know I, I can't say enough about what it meant to have Eric as an advisor, um, who was supportive of me throughout my career. Even though I doubted at many times that I wanted to stay in academia, I felt very pulled into political work, and Eric um, pushed me and challenged me to stick with it and ask the hard questions and do the work that could be of service to the movement. Um, so I, I'm giving this talk today built on some uh, a talk that I gave um, looking at Eric's latest book, his last book, How to Be an Anti-Capitalist in the 21st Century. And what I want to do today is um, dig into that work a bit um, in, in, this, and in the spirit of Eric's work and in the Haven Center tradition in sociology, um, you know, interrogate or challenge some of the concepts there and push um, for a little more um, depth or a little more nuance in some of the uh, concepts that he raises. Um, and really think about how to apply his work to the labor movement in particular. Um, and I think that, um, you know, when I, I came up with the title for this talk from general strike to minimum, uh, from minimum wage to general strike, I had not thought that, you know, general strike would actually be someone on the, on the table as a relevant conversation for major unions. Um, and I'm going to talk about that at the end about like the current moment, but I want to focus the most part of today is thinking about Eric's work as it applies to some of the labor struggles that we've seen um, in the United States and around the world in the last few years. Um, and so really what I'm trying to get at is you know, by that question is, can we see the labor movement be a force to move from struggles over wages and struggles in the workplace to broader political struggles? And of course, that is not a new question. That's been a question um, for over 100 years of uh, activists and theorists and, and leftists. Um, but I think Eric's work has something to contribute to that question. Um, and so what I'm going to do is uh, look at a couple of the um, 
the themes of his work um, based on some of the research I've done over the last several years in a number of countries. And what I had been noticing in you know, the post-2010 um, to 2014, 2015, is that workers' struggles around the world were actually winning quite a bit. Um, they were winning uh, pretty significant increases to the minimum wage or establishing minimum wages for the first time, uh, winning uh, protections for precarious workers or temporary workers, um, winning some protections um, in terms of, or increase uh, improvements in terms of labor laws. And so I wanted to really get into that and think, you know, workers seem to be on the surface winning these things, but um, what do they mean in terms of, you know, a real anti-capitalist movement? So I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a screen share here. Hopefully this <clears throat> will work um, from the start. Okay, so um, just uh, again, I'm looking at um, these kinds of wins that I was seeing around the world. Um, I do a lot of work with minimum wage and living wage campaigns. And as I was traveling, I saw you know some victories. I, I went to um, Chile, Slovenia, Indonesia, the UK, um, Germany, Japan, and I was just seeing a lot of this, uh, a lot of these gains and trying to understand what was going on. Um, so, and the question is, you know, can they be part of an anti-capitalist movement? So first of all, why care about that question, right? So it's not just that, um, you know, Eric makes a very compelling case in his book about why we should be uh, fighting for something post-capitalism, you know, the problems with capitalism and how an alternative could be better. But I think, you know, even beyond that, um, even for labor's own survival, we need to think about how it relates to capitalism. And I think that, you know, we can see in many parts of the world, labor density has fallen drastically, labor power has, has, has dropped. Um, and even at the same time that unions were really upping their game and trying to really organize. So starting in the mid 1990s, a lot of unions in the United States and, in the, and globally said, we're gonna really focus on labor revitalization. And there was a flourishing of activities of scholarly work and organizing work to say, we can do this better. We can organize, organize, organize. But 20 years later today, we see that hasn't really you know, had a major impact. We're still at only one out of 10 workers in the United States belong to unions. And clearly unions don't have um, the power that they once had. So just on the own, on the, its own terms as a labor movement, we need to be thinking about capitalism. A UE organizer named Mark Meinster just actually uh, happened to write about that last week in Labor Notes. Um, and let me pull up his quote here. Uh, and he says, the problem is that even great tactics can't overcome the social, political, and economic forces of capitalism, which combine to make organizing a gigantic cap challenge. In a free market system, employers are under intense competitive pressure to resist workers' demands. There's no generous high road for them to take. They won't willingly give in to a union drive. And employers are compelled to come together as a class to exert power over the government, passing laws and using the courts to challenge unions on all fronts. Um, so I think this really put, you know, this is uh, helping to put this on the table that the labor movement needs to deal with capitalism. But I think anyone who works in the labor movement knows that in many ways that seems like a real stretch to work, walk into a, your average workplace or into your average union meeting and start talking about capitalism um, can, can be a challenge, particularly with a workforce that grew up, an older workforce that grew up under, you know, really a lot of red baiting and people that aren't really learning a lot about capitalism in their normal daily lives. So I think, you know, one of the things about Eric's work is he makes the case that really what we can be doing uh, is promoting anti-capitalist values. Um, and one way to build that anti-capitalist movements is to focus on these values, the values of equality and fairness, democracy and freedom, and solidarity and community. Um, and so I want to talk about those today. Um, I'm going to focus a bit on that. And then I want to also talk about Eric's arguments around how to build uh, what he calls strategic logics to uh, fight capitalism and what he says to erode capitalism. OK, so I'm going to look at these concepts by using some of the examples of labor struggles around the world. So first, I want to start with um, uh, looking at the values. I want to look at comparing uh, living wage campaigns in the, in the UK versus the United States. Uh, so first of all, um, the, uh, the living wage movement in London um, began in 2001. 
Um, and it came out of the fact that the UK had never had a national minimum wage, but in 1999, they finally passed its first ever national minimum wage, and it was a relatively low value. So the uh, a community organization called Citizens UK, they had a different name then, but that's what they're called now, launched a living wage campaign. And what they did is they decided to demand from specific employers that they pay a living wage, not only to their direct employees, but to anyone subcontracted working on the premises for at least two hours a week. Um, and what they did is they targeted a bunch of employers in some of the downtown developments in London um, and they eventually won and they began to get agreements, voluntary agreements um, of uh, a lot of large employers, particularly banks, um, accounting firms, uh, large financial firms in, in um, downtown London that said, okay, we'll pay this living wage. And again, that wasn't covering tons of direct employees, but it was covering lots of indirect employees, the subcontractor workers who were janitors and food service and so forth. Um, and so, uh, the, uh, the living wage actually spread wildly. Um, and today uh, it still exists. It runs under uh, the rubric of an organization called the Living Wage Foundation. And over 6,000 employers have voluntarily signed up to pay the living wage. Um, and what they do is they agree to be accredited. They go through a, a review process and they abide by a living wage amount that's set by an independent body. Um, and what's kind of remarkable is in this context, as the voluntary living wage was growing, um, none other than Boris Johnson as mayor of London came out as a big advocate of the living wage movement. And in 2015, to most people's surprise, the conservatives in power came out and said, we're gonna up the national minimum wage to something reaching a living wage um, and, and made a big jump and calling the national, living wage, national minimum wage is now called the living wage. Um, so between the voluntary living wage and the national minimum wage, we've seen hundreds of thousands of workers in the UK receive a significant bump um, in their hourly pay. So um, it seems like a successful movement. It's had a big impact. Um, but what do we know about the values of this campaign? And this is where we start to get a bit of a challenge because you know, uh, Eric's work says we want to look at, you know, these anti-capitalist values, but how do we actually measure the values of a campaign? Um, when we look more closely, we see a lot of campaigns involve a huge alliance of forces. Um, in this one, everyone from uh, well, employers who are voluntarily paying the wage um, to workers. We have people in the campaign who are fighting for um, paying a higher wage because it's a just thing to do and they, they demand it for themselves. And we have people saying we should pay a higher wage in order to um, stimulate business and it's good for the economy. Uh, it's good for capitalism. So looking at the London living wage and trying to assess the values, you know, we can do a narrative analysis. We can look at the um, campaign literature and the websites and so forth. And the first thing, um, you know, just to pull up the London Living Wage Foundation website, to, just to give you a sense, um, the kinds of words here in a word cloud, and this is of course limited, but you can see that the real dominant themes here is other than living wage, we see um, foundation, uh, read, <laughs> employer, employers, um, and you have to really look hard. We don't really see any of those values that we talked about in terms of democracy, solidarity, um, a little bit about equality, um, but not a lot. And um, the dominant theme really, even you know, going deeper um, in, in interviews um, is really the dominant message of this campaign is that this is good for business and it's a move of social responsibility. It's um, something that businesses can do, some of them because it's good for their brand and some of them because they feel like it makes them a good corporate citizen. Now we also see a, a sub theme here, which is the Citizens UK, uh, which is the original organization that founded it. And on their website and materials, we do see um, community, we see citizens, um, but we still see employers as a fairly dominant theme. Uh, we don't see a lot about um, democracy um, or, or uh, freedom, for example, the other values. Um, and then a third theme that comes up a bit is around morality, and this is it is getting to uh, rights values of, you know, I would say equality and fairness. Um, there are a lot of religious um, 
figures involved in the living wage movement there. And this uh, quote from the Archbishop of York kind of gets at the idea of the living wage as a matter of decency. Um, he says, you would need a distorted notion of morality to disagree um, with the concept of the living wage. Okay, so now I'm gonna compare the London, uh, the UK living wage um, to the United States fight for 15 movement. And I think you're all probably more familiar with that. That emerged in 2012. Um, workers, fast food workers in New York City uh, went out uh, on strike with allies demanding $15 an hour and a union. Um, at the same time, there were campaigns on the West Coast in Seattle and SeaTac also demanding $15 an hour and this campaign quickly spread through, throughout the United States, uh, first among fast food workers, but then all kinds of groups of workers demanding $15 an hour minimum wage and a, and a living wage. Um, it also began to partner heavily and actually from the start partnered with community organizations, but um, quickly partnering with Black Lives Matter, Movement for Black Lives uh, organizations as well. And if we look here at the Fight for 15 site, Sorry, this is a bit hard to read, but the, the words here that come out are workers, 15 an hour, demand, um, you see workers again, and I'm not sure why that shows up twice, but strike and black uh, and union, justice. Okay, so there's different kinds of, of language that comes up when we begin to look at the Fight for 15 campaign. And again, if we talk um, in interviews, we see some of those themes come up in, as well and, and people's writings about this. Uh, this is a statement from Chelsea Fuller from Movement for Black Lives in 2017. She's talking about the connection between the fight for $15 an hour, uh, the connection between white supremacy and corporate greed have always been linked in America. The fast food workers who are on strike uh, for, for 15 and the right to union are resisting the same institutional racism and oppression that fuels police violence across the country. We are stronger when we stand together. And so our movements are going to keep fighting back against the twin evils of racial and economic inequality that continue to hold black and brown people, hold back black and brown people. Okay, so throughout the um, interviews, we're hearing more about, it's not just equality and fairness, but themes related to democracy and freedom, as well as community and solidarity. So different kinds of values begin to come up in this campaign. However, at the same time, depending on where the campaign is, there's also a very different message about how the campaigns themselves are run. So even if the language is focusing on the concepts of democracy, uh, many activists said the campaigns did not play out in a very democratic fashion, that they were play, they unfolded in a top-down way, that they were negotiated by lobbyists at the top, that workers had very little role to play. Now that's not true everywhere. In other cities, people said, yes, it was a more of a democratic coalition and workers had a role. So, but this is just raising um, the idea here that it's not just about the values of the words of the campaign, but the way in which the campaigns are run. Um, and so what I wanna kind of conclude from these two examples um, are two sets of issues. Is one is methodological questions about um, values is how do we measure values? Uh, how, Eric talks about anti-capitalist values, but in any movement, you're gonna get a huge range of values, um, particularly in popular ideas, such as the minimum wage that it appeals to much, much of the, the population. Um, so which values are dominant? Which values um, are really have more power? Can we weight this in terms of whose voices have more power within the coalition? And there's even variation within an organization. So even to say, what are the values the union is promoting? That might be one thing for the leadership versus the staff versus the members. Um, and also just the conclusion to look beyond just the words, the values should be uh, the narrative, but the values should also be the form in which the campaigns and the organizing is done. The second set of questions here uh, beyond the methodological are the strategic questions, which is for those who are promoting an anti-capitalist perspective, how do you do that within a much broader alliance, a broader coalition, how to find the space to promote those values? Um, some of these values are more likely to win in the short term. And in the living wage movement, the values around equality and inequality are most uh, popular because those actually even play within the business community. Inequality is bad for economic growth, um, but democracy and solidarity are less popular. So how to balance what values um, 
and, and again, how to embody the values and not just speak them. Okay, so that's the first set of um, the talking about the values. Next, I want to get uh, to Eric's concepts around the strategic logics of fighting capitalism or anti promoting anti-capitalism. So Eric promotes what he calls strategic logics of fighting capitalism. And these are historically um, what we've seen uh, as ways to fight capitalism. Um, and in the italics here, we see resisting capitalism is you know, just fighting back. Uh, and escaping capitalism um, is forming your own alternatives outside of capitalism. And those are both what he calls moves in the game. So we're working within capitalism, but we're um, you know, organizing in response. The next level up is uh, what he says is fighting on the level of rules of the game. And here he says we see taming capitalism or dismantling capitalism. And then the next highest level looking at the game itself is what he says is about smashing capitalism. Um, and this uh, also on the uh, vertical lines, we can see that these also, um, we look at the objective of the struggle. Some of these are aimed at neutralizing harms and some of them are aimed at transcending structures. Okay, and what Eric says is we don't necessarily need to choose one of these paths that in fact, all of them are part of a larger approach, what he suggests is eroding capitalism, that each of these plays a part in undermining capitalism in the long term. So I wanna take this logic and think about it specifically for the labor movement and what does it look like if we applied this to labor? And um, here, you know, I tried to give some examples of what we've seen historically. You know, Eric in his book says that we mostly see unions as resisting capitalism. We see that through strikes and workplace actions and picket lines. Um, and then to some degree, we see a lot of workers uh, movements taming capitalism through collective bargaining, through labor laws and regulations. There are other examples of labor activity in transcending structures um, in terms of escaping and dismantling and smashing, um, but these are less common. Okay, and the, 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 the idea of general strike, I will get to at the end. Um, but for now, what I wanna focus on is this second level, which is rules of the game. And that's where I think we've seen so much of the action in the last few years and particularly around taming capitalism. So I wanna talk about how to think more deeply about the labor movement taming capitalism. Okay, so um, for, uh, um, so the, what I wanna do is uh, look at some of the examples of campaigns that I've studied and think about the challenges they've faced in terms of trying to change the rules of the game. So the first one is the issue that comes up with when you try to change the rules of the game, when you put forward, uh, for example, revisions to labor law reform, um, or even putting forward minimum wage policies. Um, the, there's, it's in a way it's a game in itself. So there's the game of getting the laws changed or getting the rules changed. So you have to consider this as well as the, rule, the plays in the game. So who's making plays in the game to alter the rules? And what are the rules about changing the rules? So it's kind of meta here, but um, you know, who's allowed to actually engage with the state in changing the rules? Um, so the first example I wanna talk about is Chile. And in 2017, after many years of uh, radical uh, street uh, resistance, protest, students and uh, workers coming together for massive protests, they pressured the government to consider labor law reform. Um, and the press uh, reported this, like the final result, they did pass labor law reform in 2017 and the press reported it as pretty significant. And here's one headline uh, about uh, new labor laws emboldening striking minors. But in fact, when you get into it, when uh, I did interviews with labor leaders in Chile, um, none of them saw the labor law reform as a victory. Um, for most people, they said the proposals started out somewhat strong, but employers were just so much more organized and more powerful that throughout the reform process, uh, employers introduced over 400 amendments to the law. They tied up uh, the laws in court. They stacked the courts and they used all the tools in their, in their power to really defang the labor law. So by the time it was passed, it really was fairly weak. Um, 
On the other hand, unions did very little. They just put it in the lap of um, the legislature and expected them to handle it. So um, it's just to point out that um, the process of changing the rules of the game is itself governed by the rules of the game on who, uh, how uh, people, how different um, forces can engage with the state. Um, the second, uh, you know, or just related to that, there's lots of examples in the United States. Um, in the last several years, we've seen, you know, dozens and dozens of um, new laws at the state and local level, um, giving workers paid sick days, paid family leave, um, equal pay, um, minimum wage, living wage, um, ban the box ordinances. Um, but in fact, even though their titles may be the same, when you look closely, you can see that in many cases, employers were able to amend the laws and weaken them drastically. Um, and in the end, they did pass, but they may do very little. So for example, Alabama last year passed an Equal Pay Act. Um, but when you look at the content, it actually does very little beyond what the federal law already gives. Okay, so just that um, the content of the law can vary a lot and it's important to look within. Um, and then it's not just about the content, but it's about the capacities that come with um, the, the reforms. Um, and here, the example I would give um, is in Indonesia. Um, in 2011, 2012, uh, Indonesian unions were engaging in general strikes there and demanding higher minimum wages. Um, the wages were set by tripart committees at the local level. So union, employer, and state bodies would uh, review um, cost of living and basket of market goods and set minimum wage rates. Um, and workers were protesting, demanding that those go higher because wages were so low. And they won. They won significant increases to the wage. They, uh, they won some adjustments to how the wages were calculated over several years. And in 2015, the government passed a new law that said, we're gonna now set the wages at a living wage rate, and then we're gonna have it adjust automatically with the cost of living each year. So when many people in the US hear that, they think, wow, that's a tremendous victory. That's something we fight for here in the US because our minimum wage is just set, it stays flat. Um, and if it went up every year with the cost of living, that would be a big victory. But in fact, the unions thought this was a tremendous defeat. They saw their role in the tripart, tripart, tripartite bodies as capacity building. It showed that the unions had a role in setting wages. Unions were active in gathering information and serving um, market uh, cost of living. Um, and so to set the automatic wage um, really defanged the unions. It took them out of the, the, um, the process. And in fact, unions have been uh, filing filed lawsuits against uh, the government for that purpose. So again, it's just emphasizing that it's, it's, it's important to look deep into the content of the, um, the, the reforms as well as what it does for capacities. Okay, the second challenge um, is the, uh, the issue of capital making counter moves. And this is no surprise, but what we see in many cases is if employers lose on a new regulation, they quickly find other ways to engage. And just quickly, I'll say um, Slovenia passed very stringent temporary worker provisions or regulations um, in uh, 2014, um, it really restricted employers' rights to hire temporary workers um, and, and gave temporary workers a lot more uh, uh, rights. Um, but of course, employers responded by, in a lot of cases, just hiring them as independent contractors. So I'm, I'm going to just leave that one there because I think, you know, that's one's easy. We see a lot of cases of that where we win something and employers make a counter move. And then the third category of challenge that I would raise is also the issue of enforcement. And again, um, this is not a surprise, I don't think, to anyone. Um, but this is you know, really what happens after the law is passed. You know, it takes one kind of power to get a law passed, another kind of power to get enforced. Um, and again, this is related to the rules of the game as well. It's again about um, who has the, the resources and who has the capacity and the power to get the laws enforced. What are the penalties for non-compliance, for example? Now, 
it's not to say workers can't win. It's just to say that this is part of a class struggle and we need to think about it as, as, um, as going beyond just winning the law, like what happens after, so the time frame. Um, and again, in Indonesia, an example is workers won a law that restricted employers' rights to hire contingent workers. Employers violated the law, ignored it. Unions took them to court and won. And workers were then so emboldened by that that they used the court order and the letter to actually go and start occupying factories. Um, from May to November of 2012, um, workers conducted what they called factory raids. They held occupations in over 100 factories um, in an industrial region in Indonesia. Um, and over 100,000 workers won their jobs being converted from contingent jobs to permanent jobs. Okay, so. What I wanna conclude about this, about rules of the game is again, that there are methodological issues we wanna talk about um, how to measure rules of the game, right? So um, rules are not all of the same rules and there are, are rules within rules, right? So there are rules of the game about rules of the game. Um, so it makes for a very challenging methodological um, endeavor. Um, we need to be careful to measure the actual content of the, of the rules. Um, as well as the trade-offs that were um, given to win it. Um, and we need to measure in the longer time horizon um, the counter moves and the enforcement um, related. Um, and so it's somewhat of an iterative process. Um, it's, a, it's a process of class struggle um, and it makes it very challenging to measure. Um, and so what I might say is that, you know, perhaps for Eric's category of taming cap uh, capitalism, uh, we need more nuance. We need to understand perhaps on a spectrum, um, are these laws actually, um, um, are, are they actually neutralizing? Like when we look at the content of them, they seem good on paper, but they are, are they actually doing it? Um, and are they increasing the capacity of workers to organize around them and to enforce them? And, and are they decreasing the power of, uh, the capacity of employers? Um, Okay, and sorry, I had this is a picture of some of the factory raids. Um, and this is just a summary of some of the challenges of changing the rules of the game. Um, but I will um, keep moving here. And then, um, and just again, summarizing that I think the category of taming capitalism is just too narrow and that we need more complexity in this, uh, in this concept. Um, okay, so, and then related to that, uh, or also related to rules of the game, I would say it's not just a methodological challenge, but a strategic challenge for workers' movements, how to choose which rules to pursue, how to choose campaigns um, where the content really uh, matters as well as the form. Um, and we have to understand the rules of the game, not just as the end game, but um, you know, as, as a, basically a chess move in the larger class struggle. Um, and we have to anticipate anything we win as a change in the rule of the game is gonna provoke an employer response. And so we need to anticipate that and think about it in terms of, of future steps. Okay, so another strategic question here is that, you know, part of Eric's argument here on changing the rules of the game is that we need to engage the state but in fact, there may just be a limit to how much we can win when we only engage the state as the labor movement. Um, you know, as Eric says, the state is biased in capital's favor, but there's space to maneuver. And that seems to be true. But um, as Greg Nomaker from um, SEIU Local 26 in Minneapolis says, um, at the end of the day, the corporations are behind um, these, these governments. And what we need to do is find a way to punch those corporations in the eye. He gave the example of uh, a coalition trying to win paid sick days in Minneapolis and the city over and over again resisted and was willing to give very little. Um, and so the coalition had to go directly to the retailers, pressure the retailers directly and win negotiations with them and then go back to the city and say, this is the ordinance that we're gonna pass. Um, same thing with uh, legislation around foreclosures. Um, he says the, uh, the Democratic head of finance committee said, I have to talk to the banks to see how far we can go with this legislation. So the coalition said, okay, we can't have the state as a mediator. We need to go straight to capital. 
All right, um, so I'm gonna um, try to uh, summarize some of this and to say, um, where do we go from here? Um, so I think that, you know, Eric raises um, great, uh, great suggestions about how to think about building anti-capitalist movements or the labor movement. Um, some is by focusing on the values, some is by focusing on the rules of the game. Um, but I think um, a couple of points I wanna emphasize is one is that um, in terms of the rules of the game, one of the biggest challenges for labor to move from a wage struggle to a political struggle is that when a union challenges their employer directly, if they're really successful, if they really impede the employer, the employer goes out of business, right? There's no more jobs. Um, but if they're somewhat successful, if you win a union and if you win a collective bargaining agreement, then your interests become tied up directly with the employer. Uh, Ellen Wood writes about you know, how suddenly then it becomes that the Ford employee has more in common with Ford Corporation than they do with the Chrysler employee. The Chrysler employee is the competition, right? So our, our challenge here is to target the rules of the game um, in a way that um, launches our, our efforts at the state and the way in which the state enables employers as a class. So we're, in, we're targeting employers as a class rather than necessarily as individual employers. Um, and that's you know, the ways in which we can change, the, we should prioritize the ways to change the rules of the game that limit corporate power. Things like antitrust legislation, um, corporate citizenship, um, trade and investment freedoms and so forth. Second um, a point that uh, Daniel Galvin has made about the difference between employment law and labor law. So a lot of what we've seen in the last uh, couple of decades, uh, these labor uh, victories are really employment law. They're improving wages and working conditions and less so about labor law. And the distinction here and his argument is that, you know, we can maybe see this as increasingly employment laws are being passed to patch up what collective bargaining used to do or should be doing, right? So raising wages, providing paid sick days, uh, protecting scheduling and so forth. If workers had power, if unions had power, that would be happening through collective bargaining. Um, and so employment laws can focus on neutralizing the harms, but it's really the labor laws that can be increasing capacity of workers to organize. And so this is the second area we wanna prioritize rules of the game that increase uh, uh, workers' power to organize. And you can see this um, in, the, um, in the ILO fundamental conventions. ILO has eight core conventions um, that countries ratify. Um, countries are much more likely to ratify uh, conventions around child labor, forced labor, discrimination, and the least popular are freedom of association and collective bargaining, right? So even in the international level, we can get employment law passed more easily than we can get labor law, uh, the, the kinds of laws that give workers the power to organize. Okay, and then the last point is just, um, I would say the key challenge of solidarity. Um, and this is both about the values of solidarity uh, as well as the rules of the game. Um, so, you know, Eric points out that the, um, you know, we're trying to build a collective actor against capitalism, um, facing the challenges that, um, you know, we have this, workers have many interests. They're not just workers. They have um, other interests that sometimes compete against class and sometimes compete against each other. Um, and that employers in the state use these divisions and use their tools to divide and conquer workers. Now that's not to say that it only comes from that. It also comes from workers themselves, certainly racism and patriarchy and so forth can be worker against worker within the working class. But we wanna think about the kinds of reforms that reduce the employer's power to divide and conquer or reduce the power of the state to divide and conquer. Um, one of the inspiring examples I would say is with the bargaining for the common good framework. Um, and that's where we're seeing more and more unions come together with community partners, allies, using the unique power of unions to win demands for workers and the broader community. The most well-known examples are with the teachers, starting with the Chicago Teachers Union, um, really bringing together demands for workers and students. 
Um, but there's lots of other examples, again, going back to the Twin Cities where janitors and environmentalists work together to target big companies in Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, as a way to use better cleaning um, uh, chemicals, uh, as a way to reduce environmental impact in a way that benefited both, um, both parties. And I can say more about that um, in the question. Well, I'll just say quickly that I think, um, you know, it was a really interesting case where the union worked with its environmental partners thinking we have some common interests here. Um, in both cases, it's the big companies that are kind of um, polluting and also holding wages down. Um, and when the union went to its membership and talked to them about environmental issues, they found that the workers themselves were already very much wanting to pursue environmental demands, both because they didn't like the toxic chemicals they had to clean with, but a lot of the workers saw themselves as climate refugees. They had come to this country because of the environmental damage of the climate crisis in their home countries. And um, they saw this as a key demand that the union should take up. So bargaining for the common good campaigns are a way of building solidarity um, around common values um, of community, but also, again, decreasing the power of the state or the power of capital to divide and conquer um, and keep us apart. Okay, so that is a lot. I just wanna end really quickly um, on, oh, sorry, this is a picture of um, Minneapolis St. Paul of, of some of the picket lines of, uh, and the, the rallies around the strike that the janitors held to win these demands. Um, and I should say too, interestingly enough, the uh, employers held out the very last issue. The contract was not gonna be settled. They were uh, almost gonna have to extend the strike over the idea of a green, green cleaning fund. So the employers agreed to like raise wages and give better benefits, but they really resisted on giving in on a demand that was an intersectional demand between the movement. And that's, um, even though it was a less, you know, not as much financial uh, demand, but it, I think the employers understand also that they, the power of workers to work together with the community uh, is, is very dangerous for them. Okay, and then what I wanted to just end with was this idea of what's going on right now, since I raised the idea of general strike. Um, and I just um, wrote a short article um, yesterday uh, interviewing a number of, of union leaders and activists about the idea of, can we see a political strike in the context of the election? Um, if Trump uh, interferes with the election or won't step down, um, you know, we are seeing increasingly numbers of labor bodies, unions, uh, labor councils saying they're ready to step up and defend democracy. Um, there's a group called Labor Action to Defend Democracy uh, and people can sign up there. You know, my personal thought here is that obviously general strikes in the United States are rare. We've seen them at the city level in a few cases. Um, we've seen them in uh, racial justice. Uh, w. Du Bois you know, talked about the general strike in terms of enslaved workers resisting during the Civil War or do th during the 2006 immigration um, reform. But we've also seen increasingly uh, the use of political strikes in recent years. And, Madison is an example of that in 2011, um, in response to Governor Walker's budget proposal, we saw teachers walk off the job, basically a political strike. Um, we saw it in 2016, the Chicago teachers strike where other workers around the city walked off the job in solidarity. Um, and then most recently um, from professional athletes uh, to healthcare workers striking in support of Black Lives Matter. Um, so for many workers, it's illegal to strike if you're a public sector, if you have a contract, but we're seeing you know, a growing interest um, in that. And um, you know, it's something that would, I would love to talk about in the Q&A, um, but I will leave it um, there for now. So thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you very much, Stephanie. That was really great. And I'm sure Eric would have been both very pleased and very excited to be part of this discussion. Obviously he can. Um, but um, I'm sure that other people have questions and comments that they'd like to put forward uh, to be part of this conversation. And this is how we'll proceed. So there is at the bottom of your screen a menu and an um, item on that menu is the participants function. And all you need to do is click on that and you can raise your hand, which will alert me that you wanna ask a question or make a comment. 
And what we're going to do is that I'll take uh, them in a cluster of three. So I'll call on three people. We'll unmute you one at a time to make your question or comment, and then turn it over to Stephanie to respond, followed by another set of three. Um, for those of you who, um, who might find that a little intimidating, you can also raise a question or make a comment via the chat function, which is to the immediate right of that participants uh, function on the menu. And I'll just read out your question or comment. So the floor is open. Is there anybody who would like to raise a question or make a comment? This is what's known as a pregnant pause. Anyone? I can right, so, a question. <laughs> well, I have now a couple of people who okay. <laughs> Who've, who've been brave enough to raise their hand. So the first one is Dan Wang. Uh, Dan, uh, we'll unmute you and you can go ahead. And can you activate your camera when you ask your question? Sure, okay, good. Good to see you, Patrick. You too. Uh, uh, yeah, the question is, and I'm, I'm sorry, you may have maybe referred to this or addressed it. I had a little connectivity gap uh, in one part of your talk. But um, <clears throat> some of what you say about this, the values and like labor movement and then the, the larger you know, anti-capitalist values um, and the example uh, uh, from Minneapolis, it makes me and probably makes other people who are you know, my age and generation uh, think of the movements of the 90s, which you know, came to a head uh, in the popular telling in Seattle in 99, where um, you, know, you had environmentalists uh, um, activated right alongside, and in some cases coordinating with trade, trade uh, unions and labor activists and worker rights um, kinds of organizations um, that had all sorts of worker, workers' rights issues on the table um, in that moment of, you know, uh, all the international trade stuff that was going on. Um, and then of course, as we know, what happened was, you know, 9-11 comes along, there's this, what at the time was this like strange new enemy that people didn't understand. Um, it brought in a, it, you know, it kind of, kind of, kind of threw everything back, um, kind of almost overnight and, uh, put, you know, an anti-war, uh, uh, item at, at the top of the agenda suddenly and every everything kind of uh, you know all of that that all of that momentum that had been building from say like 94 to 99 um, was you know more or less uh, you know uh, sh shattered or fractured um, and it sounds like the what you're talking about is that almost feels like going back to square one of trying to build this consciousness again and, and in the form of you know uh, you know as expressed in organizing so I guess I just want to hear like what maybe what you have to say about this like historical uh, kind of perspective of you know what's changed since then what you know what how 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 does the consciousness need to change now I mean I obviously the climate thing is a new urgency of, you know factor anyways I'll leave it at that just kind of like throwing that all out towards you to hear hear some of what you have to say thank you so much Okay, uh, the next person in line in the stack is Rebecca Meyer-Rao. Rebecca, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I am the executive director of Worker Justice Wisconsin, which has a worker center and also forms coalitions with unions and faith communities for um, low wage workers, um, mostly non-unionized workers. And my question for you is simply, um, in this bargaining for the common good, uh, have you noticed a role for worker centers like ours that again are supporting low wage non unionized workers in coalition, hopefully, with unions and faith communities? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next person in the stack asks a question via chat. Volti um, says If the unions win and the employer goes out of business, won't it be better to convert the business into a worker co op and give the success to the workers? 
I know it is not going to be that easy, but there have been cases of that happening in Greece. Okay, so there's your cluster of three questions, Stephanie. Sure, yeah, okay, those are great questions. Well, the, I think that, um, well, first the easy one is, yes, I should have been clear about that worker centers have also been at the table with a lot of the bargaining for the common good. And I, I would say like, organizations that are also kind of somewhat fuzzy in terms of like um, the, you know, the Partnership for Working Families, which is like bringing together unions and community allies and worker centers. Um, and so I think that's been a very uh, fruitful space. Um, you know, unions are generally uh, more dominant in that a lot of the campaigns are centered around the collective bargaining process. Um, but they've worked to bring worker centers to the table. And partly what you know, the process is doing is saying, we're gonna reject the notion that there's um, permissive and non-permissive subjects of bargaining. We're gonna just bring people to the table around the issues that we think matter. Um, you know, I, I did this myself as part of a faculty union um, at, when I used to be at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, and we said, we're gonna, we're gonna bargain around class size and we're gonna bargain, uh, we're gonna bring student groups to the table for bargaining. And they kept saying, you can't do that. That's not allowed in bargaining. And we just said, we're doing that. So I think that that's the kind of relationship that's gone on with worker centers is around um, whether it's um, worker issues or community or housing issues, a lot around foreclosure issues, um, there's been a fruitful partnership. Um, and then on the worker co-ops, I would say, you know, absolutely, I think, and you know, the uh, Eric's model calls that escaping capitalism, which is trying to build these alternative models, um, it, it, which he very much sees as part of eroding ca capitalism, is supporting uh, worker co-ops. And so I think, um, yes, um, I, I do agree that it would be great to take failed businesses and convert them to worker co-ops. Um, and that certainly happened more so in other, not just Greece, as you, I think you mentioned, but um, Argentina, much, you know, many parts of Latin America. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think it just takes, you know, a lot of infrastructure because a lot of what businesses struggle with is access to funding, you know, to credit. Um, they need to be part of a supply, uh, you know, a supply chain, you know, you're, who you're going to get your inputs from, who you're going to sell your product to. So the more um, infrastructure there is for the co-op, the more likely they are um, to survive. And historically, we've seen um, co-ops tend to really uh, grow in the periods of economic downturn. And so we might see a, a greater flourishing of the co-op model um, in, in the coming year or two. Um, so yes, I, I think that's the part of it here. And I think we need to think of ways to bring the worker co-op movement, which is you know, alive and thriving, um, more into um, the broader labor movement uh, in some of these, like in perhaps like in the bargaining for the common good um, campaigns. Um, and then Dan's question, which I think, um, well, is a big one. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm not sure where to start on that. But, you know, I think partly what you're, you know, if I'm understanding is talking about how to kind of rebuild the labor movement from scratch. And I think to some extent, that's kind of, yes, where we are at. Um, you know, in other periods of upsurge, um, you know, the labor movement doesn't tend to grow like incrementally, it tends to grow in in periods of upsurge when social movements are large and thriving in other ways as well. Um, and when political organization is alive and thriving. And we don't, we have a, a large flourishing of um, social movements right now, um, particularly since Trump, but not so much around political organization. A bit, I mean, certainly I shouldn't, I shouldn't say none because uh, DSA is actually huge. Um, but you know, that's like a relatively recent uh, flourishing. So we have lots of people out there who are really hungry for um, education, training, um, understanding history of, of labor movements, understanding the skills that it takes. Um, and so, so I think there's a thirst out there, there's an interest for it. On the part of the labor movement, you know, I think as some people have said that there's two big challenges is one are the unions that are just um, still big enough to think that they can go it alone. They are big enough to feel like they can win stuff um, in the traditional ways. And some of them still can, um, but that's less and less common. And they're certainly maybe not winning things uh, much beyond maybe a narrow gains. They're not really winning political changes. They're not winning uh, changes to the rules of the game. 
Um, so we have some big unions left that are still tending to go it on their own and try to like win in traditional ways. And then we have a lot of unions that are just small and weak and you know, maybe afraid to take on a big fight um, because it means really going after these massive corporations with massive amounts of power. So, um, you know, so that's a challenge too, is like the unions that are too big or too small. And a lot of the change that we're seeing, I would say is maybe these unions in the middle that are, have their sets, their sites set high enough um, to win things, but, um, uh, you know, know that they can't win it on their own. Um, and they, they, uh, you know, so a lot of that is, you know, political orientation and some of that is skills. Like, how do we actually do it? How do we learn to strike? How do we organize a workplace? Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Okay, I have several people in the stack, uh, starting with Joel Rogers. Uh, and if you can activate your camera when you ask your question. Hi, Stephanie, great to see you again. Uh, you talked about all these different struggles and, and the work is uh, that you've done and, and your visits all over the world are incredibly rich in detail on, uh, even though the visits are relatively short, on, on the worker end of the stuff. Uh, <laughs> But I was at, I wonder if in thinking, uh, looking out, you know, more strategically uh, about how you could scale this stuff, if you think it's possible to do it from uh, essentially just work uh, place or industry based uh, uh, actions, <clears throat> uh, making occasional alliances with environmentalists or some other group that with whom they find sort of common purpose or if you really need some um, political organization, you know, a party or quasi party operating at uh, areas of, of this struggle. Um, I mean, I think you do, uh, as I think you know, um, but I'd be interested in your reflections on, on that. And then if, if you could, uh, just another stray question, uh, if you could comment from this perspective in the US on on the uh, PRO Act, uh, which all these uh, Democratic senators say they're going to pass right away, which gets rid of uh, 14B, which is great. You know, it's been a demand of labor. That's the, that's the um, uh, you know, uh, right to uh, work for less uh, provisions of Taft Harley. And also 8.4, you know, the, the limitations on secondary activity, which is very, very exciting because it would allow labor finally to map those supply chains and act all over but gets rid of actually building power through uh, card check. Uh, so it's a very mixed bag. Some people in labor hate it. Others think it's going to be a new revolution. I was just interested in your comment on, on the PRO Act. But mostly I'm interested in where the politics and what a possible political organization uh, might look like. It's particularly at the, at the urban level that, that is the center of most of your stuff, but, but uh, statewide or national, whatever. Okay. okay, our next question comes via chat, which is from S. Paschke, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who says, I respect the need for rules and enforcement to change the game as it were. I want to reiterate that workers must expect pushback from employers and government and need to formulate a multi-tiered response. Too often workers experience government and employers as dishonest brokers in labor and worker negotiations. And the third comes from Jordan Henrik. Um, and again, if you can, Jordan, please activate your camera. Thanks so much. And, and thanks, Stephanie, for your uh, talk. I learned a lot. Um, you talked a bit about you know, the need to pressure corporations in addition to governments, um, given that governments are often beholden to the corporations themselves. Um, my, my question, I'm wondering if you can comment on, wouldn't that kind of lead to these like self-policing or self-regulation by corporations, which we know can be uh, less effective than, because then the corporations can kind of change their own regulations uh, later on once, once it suits their needs. Um, just wondering if you could comment, thanks. Sure. Okay, and just to, uh, before I turning it over to Stephanie, a reminder that for the rest of you that again, that function for raising your hands is in the um, participants part of your um, menu, you just click raise hand. All right, thanks. Um, sure, so I thank you everyone. I'm gonna 
uh, start actually the, the last question about uh, corporations. So I think that I, mean, I agree with you that if um, just going after the corporation and getting them to sign a kind of corporate social responsibility uh, code um, is a challenge because then they could always go back on it. I don't think voluntary um, solutions are enough on their own. I think we also want state regulations as well. So I think, you know, what the folks in twin, the Twin Cities were, you know, making the case of like, you go after both, like you're wanting to reform a state regulation, but part of that is getting, um, you know, targeting the corporation and getting uh, a deal with them as well to like take this bigger and broader than what you might've been able to win through the state directly. Um, you know, I think that the evidence is pretty clear that corporate social responsibility measures, you know, really have very little impact. Um, or there may be a handful of firms that can do that. And that's a model that has worked for them over time, but that's never gonna, you know, address the, que the question of scale. Um, and uh, so we wanna be, yeah, targeting employers as a class and, and not necessarily, like the goal isn't a one by one, even though you might have a campaign that targets them one by one. Um, so, and then the, the other question about the, um, uh, you know, in terms of scale. So Joel's question, uh, yes, Joel, I still definitely uh, believe we need a political organization. So um, that I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think that these are counterposts at all. Uh, I think that, you know, really what we see with the Democratic Party over and over again are just disaffiliation from political, the political work, the non-voters, uh, you know, people are just so alienated, um, you know, from the political process and see, you know, the Democrats are doing nothing for them, doing very little. Um, so, but I, I think that, I don't think that means we abandon the political organization concept altogether. Um, but I think that, you know, the evidence is just so strong. And obviously some of this I've learned from you, which is, you know, that um, as the union movement has declined, uh, we just don't have the organization there in places where people have lost their jobs or, you know, we've had deindustrialization. There's just no kind of framework that people have and they lose their job and they blame themselves or they blame their coworkers or they blame China or Mexico, you know, and really without workplace organizing as one place to prevent, to provide an alternative framework, um, you know, it's a big leap to the political party. So like, we need the organizations on the ground and they don't have to be just workplace based. I mean, I think that that's what is beautiful about the bargaining for the common good framework is we're also saying we need that organization in the community organizations and the environmental and student organizations, but just increasing the level of on the ground, uh, face to face organizing to provide those alternative narratives so that people can understand their situation. And I think that's the foundation then for the political organization. Um, so yeah, I think they definitely have to go together. Um, and the PRO Act, well, <laughs> you know, I think that the overall, I, I believe that the package of changes of the PRO Act would be positive, but I actually just have the hardest time getting excited by it as something that seems comprehensive. I just think if our kind of the hope of this movement is something that appeals and makes it feels like it's on behalf of the broader working class, at least the way it's been framed so far is not, I don't think it's doing that. I just don't think it's exciting a base of people. I don't even think it's exciting a lot of union members. I think we need to consider labor law reform, but in a way that is a much more movement building orientation. This feels still too technical to me. And I just, I just don't see it. I don't, I just, can't feel that it's going to be the thing that works. Um, but I'm curious to hear your opinions on that. And then the third, um, the second one was about rules and enforcement. And I'm not sure if I followed that question, but I think part of it was saying that workers often see employers and government as dishonest and corrupt and not standing up for workers. And yes, I agree completely. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think we, that means we throw out the state. I think it means you know, and Eric's point here is again, you know, the odds are stacked against us. The state is usually going to be against us, but there's space to fight. 
And that means even within state actors, people that we elect to office, um, we have champions that we work with in city councils and state legislatures, um, but with people who are appointed to office who work within city agencies. Um, but the idea is building you know, uh, and, and, you know, I'm just here saying what Eric's, you know, points are and, and uh, you know, building the capacity of states so that we um, force them to be more democratic and force them to be more responsive to democratic demands of people rather than corporations. Things like um, advisory boards uh, to enforce laws, um, you know, Department of Labor expanding, um, working with community organizations to inspect workplaces, um, you know, uh, really bringing in more people into the process that have, whether it's unions or community organizations or nonprofits that have a role in educating workers about their rights. Um, and of course, Joel has written lots about this as well uh, as Eric. So yeah, I agree that that's, that's the way most workers experience it, but we have to fight to change that. Okay, I've got several more questions, starting with one that's come via chat from Harry Richardson and Barbara Smith who asked, can you talk about the prospects for a general strike if Trump refuses to leave office? Specifically, who is on board now and the prospects for it growing? How will this affect labor in the future? Um, next is Gay Seidman. Um, Stephanie, that was a great talk, so thank you very much. But can I ask a, a hard question? <laughs> I'm always struck in the US about how uncomfortable we are in talking about the way in which the organizational structure of unions actually creates exactly the tension that you referred to sort of in passing, where what's good for one employer may be bad for another and wor workers in a union who identify with an employer or a particular industry may support policies that aren't necessarily what's great for the common good. In South Africa, you know, this has turned into a complete um, I think clusterfuck is probably the only word to use for it, um, where unions that used to be allies are now desperately stealing members from each other because of the economic structure of the organization. And I've always wondered in the US why it's so hard for us, especially people who care about labor in the US, have such trouble ever addressing the organizational issues, the way our unions are formed and funded, actually under girds a kind of local identity rather than the common good identity. And I don't understand why it's never discussed as an issue in the US. And I also would love to know if you have any suggestions for what to do about it. Okay, and our third question in this particular cluster, a different kind of cluster than Gay was referring to, um, comes from Lane. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you for the talk. That was terrific. Um, so, you know, it strikes me that we are at a moment uh, that is a very pivotal one and that, uh, you know, the next five years, 10 years is definitely going to see change for working people. So I wonder if you would take a minute and uh, maybe dream with us a minute and tell us what you see as, I won't say victory in worker power, but progress in building worker power, what that might look like uh, over the next five or 10 years, especially if we're thinking big. Wow, okay, great. Oh, wait, can I just, Lane, can you say prog progress in building worker power over the next, Five or ten years, so, yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everyone. It's it's just so nice to like uh, hear from um, friends and some old friends uh, that I haven't talked to in a long time, and um, I just wish this was in person. So um, the the well the easy the first one not the easy one but the first question about the general strike. Um, so that, to my understanding, is changing pretty much day by day. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the, the union bodies that have, and activists who have come around it were um, for the labor action to defend democracy, um, you know, come out of the US labor against the war 
Um, but you know, the Chicago Teachers Union is pretty uh, fundamental in pushing this uh, formation. The Massachusetts Teachers Association, which is statewide, um, has endorsed it. Um, you know, Sarah Nelson from the, the flight attendants has um, been active, the United Electrical Workers, the ILWU, some of the locals. Um, uh, and I don't know if, um, um, I mean, the AFT uh, more broadly, I'm not sure if they've, in, I don't think that they've endorsed it as a national union, but certainly a number of the locals um, are engaging in these conversations. The last phone call for the Labor Action to Defend Democracy had about 60 labor councils and unions involved, and um, there'll be another call this week. Um, but as far as I can tell, like unions are signing up quickly by the day. You know, so the question is, what does that mean? Um, and it's not just unions, Jobs with Justice has endorsed, um, and I think, you know, other kinds of uh, worker formations will also be engaging. Um, but of course, Sorry, it varies as to what that means, right? So clearly not everyone is signing up to strike. They're, they're signing up for labor actions. That might be a walk off the job. It might mean a work slowdown. Uh, you know, might be sending members to uh, certain cities for protests. Um, you know, but as we know, a general strike, um, you know, this is an elusive concept. It doesn't even always mean in every country people stopping work, right? Sometimes a general strike is in fact, um, people not at the workplace, but just a massive protest. So I think that we don't really know what this is gonna look like. Um, certainly Sarah Nelson um, has said, you know, made comments about being in strategic locations of if flights are not taking off and if certain ports are not functioning, there are certain, some of the unions that are endorsing this are in much more strategic positions to, to create a slowdown, but, um, you know, the idea of getting a whole bunch of public sector workers to strike illegally, you know, that's that we'll see what happens there. So I think um, my understanding is that groups will be monitoring on the election day and in making a call that by that night or the early next morning as to what might be the next steps. But I know that there are already actions planned around the country for November 4th and November 7th. Um, and whether those actions are, you know, more like a protest or actually workers walking off the job is, you know, what I guess we're all waiting to see. So I'd love to hear from others if they have more information about that. Um, so, um, Gay, I think it's such a good question. You're right. It's a hard question. It, you know, for a while, I think I was, you know, when I've been in a number of these countries trying to figure out what's the ideal structure. And, um, you know, I was always struck by the fact that what one person, well, there's an argument for something being ideal in one country was terrible in another. Um, and it just doesn't seem to be that there's one model that really anyone could point to as best. Even the idea of should we have, should we allow multiple unions in one workplace, right? In some places that seems, yeah, like a disaster um, where the unions are competing, like kind of, yeah, what you're talking about. You know, in Indonesia, like even a, a lot of the unions themselves complain that it's so easy to form a union that you could have 40 unions in one workplace and you just can't coordinate anything. Um, whereas on the other side of it, when it's so hard to form a union, that's obviously a problem too. Um, so I wish I had a good answer for you. Um, I don't, I just think that to me, what the best answer is that new structures emerge out of um, struggle, out of, uh, you know, new people, new workers coming in and fighting for what works for them and having a greater voice of the movements in what the structures are that work for them. And to me, that probably means a lot of young workers saying like, this is how we envision a more functioning and productive uh, union structure. Um, I agree, the one we have doesn't work, um, but um, it's hard to point to the ideal model. Um, and I, I do think you're right that it's not discussed at all amongst the traditional union movement, but I do think it's discussed amongst young workers who are organizing now. And, you know, I just did a lot of interviews with uh, the Writers Guild, a lot of the uh, digital media workers who them, they are remaking their notion of what a union means to them. They're not necessarily in the same workplace. They're not all working the same hours. They have a very different kind of structure of work. And I think that partly what's exciting is that what they love about being in that union is the democratic space to, to make the union work for them. Um, so hopefully we can see more of that. Um, and then uh, Lane, <laughs> this is also such a hard question. I 
can I feel like I'm at my dissertation defense right now? Um, so, um, you know, the progress on worker power, um, you know, I, I, I really, I think that's why I, I, I was moved to talk about Eric's work, not just because he was my advisor and, uh, but I just think this idea that we need to be refocusing on the values of what our society looks like. It's not just about what our workplace looks like. Um, the focus on the workplace has, it just does not work um, for so many people. Uh, this, even this idea of like, let's organize to get back to the standard work week, or let's organize to get back to, um, you know, the, um, even the idea of a living wage. It, that's not working for people. Like, so I think for me, a measure of worker progress is that we have greater input by working people into defining the parameters of what actually even work is like what is work about why why do we have the jobs that we have um how do we structure the jobs that we have how do we structure the work week um so really re-questioning like you know the the entire structure of of what we're doing not rebuilding the same thing um and that's not really um easy to measure. So, so I think part of your question is how do we measure that? But um, I, I think returning, you know, so why unions are certainly popular, like we're at a relatively high level right now, 65% of people approve of unions, but of, amongst a lot of the people in the unions, like a lot of my students who are full-time union members, they've been in their unions for 20 or 30 years, they are demoralized and discouraged by their unions. They just don't see them as uh, anything that's like meaningful to their lives, anything that's addressing their housing issues, their kids' school issues, like the things that, you know, matter a lot to them outside of the workplace. Um, and I just think we need to be rethinking like unions in a holistic sense and worker movements, worker power in that holistic sense. Okay. Um, I think we, we have time for one more cluster of questions. Um, and I only have one person so far who's raised one. If others want to, please indicate by raising your hand through the participants part of the menu. Um, this one comes from chat from Mike, who asks, is the one big union concept advanced principally by the IWW, one that might help to reduce internecine conflict between unions? Um, anybody else want to take a the opportunity to ask a question with this in these last few minutes. Well, um, you can continue to think about that. Maybe in the meantime, Stephanie will respond to this question about the IWW. Uh, it's, uh, that's a great question. Um, so I love the idea of one big union in theory. In practice, um, I know that there are still a lot of complications with that idea, um, I'm just speaking from my own experience right now, I'm in the, a member of the Professional Staff Congress, uh, American Federation of Teachers at CUNY. Um, we're not one big union, but we have um, full-time faculty, adjuncts, graduate students, uh, full-time staff, um, non-teaching adjuncts. We have many, many job titles in our union. And for the most part, I think that's a good thing, but we have to you know, learn within our labor movements if we are gonna have these big unions, how do you deal with the fact that you're in a union with sometimes with your supervisor or your boss? Um, or how do you deal like, so I'll be in, in the same union as my dean and as well as a graduate student that uh, is working for me. Um, and how do you deal with the fact that there are certain job titles that have a lot more power than others? Um, and where certain job titles, people in job titles don't feel they have as much authority or you know, priority in the union. So um, I do like the general idea of one big union. And I think that's, you know, where we want to be thinking as how we are thinking more collectively. And ideally, even, you know, finding ways for students as students to be part of these larger structures. Um, but I don't think we can be romantic about, you know, the challenges of power dynamics within that. Um, and that that's going to take a lot of creative thinking. Yeah, I think we have a question from Eleni Shermer. Is that the case or did I misread that? Yep. Okay, there she is. Hey, Stephanie, this is a great talk. It's uh, 
awesome to be here and so such a trip to see so many people from all over the world, uh, which is really cool. Um, my question is one that I think you're, you're like, you've, you're touching, but I'm just going to, I guess, probably be asking you to repeat yourself. So apologies and thank you. Um, but it's just this question of how we look at workers, how, how do we both um, build workers' capacity to develop their own internal power in unions at the same time as, as unions are able to really get sharp on analyzing and mapping their targets, ca the capital that's moving around them. Um, I guess what I'm trying to sort of say is like, what's, how, do, how, how do we actually use the work of sort of like challenging finance, the, the, the building movements against the financialized economy such that it's actually empowering workers rather than just sharpening our understanding of who workers' enemies are. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think if I understand you, you're kind of asking how to combine our need to be really sh sharp and strategic at a very high level, along with like doing popular education and worker organizing at the base. Exactly. Uh, yeah, because yeah. I think, yeah, it often gets kind of falsely counterposed as if we have to do one or the other. Um, and yeah, and, the, and part of the, the problem with some of our strategic campaigns is we, you know, we end up making this uh, moves based on like reading very confusing financial documents and, you know, developing very strategic, you know, technical campaigns that really kind of leave workers behind. Um, I guess, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be overly <laughs> optimistic, but I think because I'm in labor education, I do feel optimistic about the ability to bring this um, to workers. And, you know, I think the Chicago teachers, you know, I mean, that's a different kind of union. They're teachers and they read and so forth. But I think the example of, you know, that union prioritizing, taking the analytics of who they were fighting against and then also like studying the proposed contracts and taking the time and making that a priority. Um, you know, other unions, I think Unifor in Canada has done this as well. Like they build education into the union's mission. Um, they find ways to have, you know, workers get paid time off to attend trainings and educational programs. And I think, you know, whether it's studying structural racism or studying financial capitalism, it's not going to be every worker that's going to want to do that or is going to understand that. But um, that's, you know, I think something to aspire to. And I've just continued to see it over and over again that um, the students that come through our classes just um, get, that's the stuff that excites them when they feel they're part of, like, understanding what the union is actually doing, what the, is behind the union, they start to like have a new, you know, it starts to click for them in a different way. And maybe we don't have the capacity to involve all of those members in every strategic decision, but to involve them in understanding the analysis um, and developing strategy, I think is the goal. Um, I feel like I'm not sure I understand, I answered that question, but um, that's, that's, my, that's my, uh, my hope is that we retain both. We retain the top-down strategy as well as the bottom-up organizing um, as much as possible. <laughs> um, we are at 4.30, but we do have one more per quick person who'd like to ask a question. Are you open to that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So Dan, go ahead. Dan Wang. My first question. Um, well, well, all this talk about um, the unions and, and, and workers, what about this uh, secular trend of at least in um, a nation like the United States and an economy like the United States, there are just being fewer workers um, and uh, capital, you know, responding to worker worker uh, worker movements um, by automating more. And we've seen this uh, break into the popular discourse through, uh, you know, Andrew Yang, um, but also, as you know, um, um, you know, Eric uh, uh, kind of uh, dealt some with this, with uh, his uh, writings about uh, universal basic income. So can we talk about like those, the people who are, you know, like we have all these other people, right? The incarcerated people, homeless people, chronically unemployed people, you know, like, like people who were formerly, you know, 50 years ago and 75 years ago, workers. So what's going on there? Thanks. Sure. 
So that's one area I didn't agree with Eric's book. I, um, I personally believe that the technology argument is overrated. I think that it's always been there from the start. That's what employers try and do is introduce new technologies to replace workers or de-skill workers. That's, um, that's just part of capitalism. And I think that that certainly is going on now as well, but I, I don't actually see it replacing workers altogether because I think there's just so much work that still needs to be done. Um, and in, in many ways you can say, okay, technology is replacing certain categories, but we're gonna need all kinds of new workers to assist in climate disaster. Um, you know, everything from mental health issues related to that, to rebuilding communities, to planting trees. We need healthcare workers. We need, you know, this pandemic should teach us we need massive investment in community healthcare workers, people that, you know, are assigned to their neighborhoods that do community uh, health education. So I think, you know, the, we just have so much work that is there that needs to be done. Um, and that's why I do think a universal basic income, I support that, but I, I also support a federal jobs program. And I think really what we want to look at is massive investment rather than, you know, trillions of dollars to Wall Street and corporate bailouts. Let's be putting that money into hiring people to do the work we need to do to make our lives sustainable, um, to center human need, um, to make essential work uh, is, is our healthcare, is our cultural work, um, arts workers, um, healthcare, community health, education, hire more teachers, um, lots to be done. So uh, I, don't, I don't think technology is really gonna wipe out workers in the same way. It is definitely a tool and it's up for battle, but let's not give up that battle. Let's use technology to make our lives better, but not uh, let employers control how it's used. Well, thanks, Stephanie. We should have you on every week. This is really fabulous and much appreciated. I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody. Um, so thanks so much for doing this. Um, sorry you. that we couldn't have you in person. Um, I do want to make a plug for uh, the people coming up soon in our series. I'm posting to everyone on the uh, chat function the link to our website. Um, and just coming up on Thursday, we have Helen Scott, who's a professor of English at the University of Vermont, who will be talking about uh, Rosa Luxemburg and literature. Uh, that's at 4 p.m. on Thursday. That sounds maybe like a somewhat obscure topic to you all, but I can attest that she's a fabulous um, speaker. You, you should find that super interesting. And then next week, we have Simon Balto, who um, is a product of the University of Wisconsin's History Department, Assistant Professor of History and African American Studies at Iowa. He'll be talking about Racist Policing, the History of Racist Policing in the United States that's based on his book that has come out this year and which made him quite well known across the United States. And then you can see among other people, Adam Tews on the screen there, as well as Lane Windham, um, who will be giving a couple of talks in uh, mid-November. Um, and I hope that you'll turn out for that as well. So, uh, we have, um, but that isn't even the entirety of it. You can see our website there at the bottom of the screen for more information. So I hope that all of you will come and that you'll encourage people to join you. Thanks again. And thanks especially to Stephanie. Thank you so much.